My name is John Cornicello, and I welcome you to my series of live interactive photo conversations. You can check out the schedule at cornicello.com slash conversations for dates and times of upcoming shows. You'll also find links to previous conversations there. Um, upcoming now, we have Dan Burkholder and Jeff Shiwi. If you know of a photographer you'd like to see on the show, please send us both an introduction email. And go ahead and let Cheryl in. Just did. Great. Uh, today, my guest is Peter Crow. Peter is 30 years in photography, having done a variety of commercial work and what he calls real people photography. In 2005, he released the Damn Book, which is now in its third edition, and he also has a set of workflow guides. His latest endeavor has been working as chief production as chief product officer for Tandem Vault, building the next generation of digital asset management applications. So please welcome Peter Crow. Thanks, John. Sure. Yeah. It's uh, it's good to be able to have contact with people, even though it's virtual. Yeah. And should we uh, start by looking at a few pictures? Sure, let's do that. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen, choose the right one. <laughs> let's hope. And go ahead here. Oh, let's go over to Keynote. There you go. Seeing the proper screen. I am. Okay, awesome. Um, so photography, like probably everybody here has been in my blood. Um, starting back in high school, this, uh, and then in college, there's a handful of uh, images here. Was lucky enough to have one of the greatest subjects in the world to photograph the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, including uh, the year Michael Jordan was there and they won the national championship and series of luminaries coming through Buckminster Fuller in this case and uh, U2's first uh, United States tour. Um, uh, these, by the way, are, uh, are all scanned directly from negatives. Uh, have one of the important things that I've been working on and helping other people with is um, getting their uh, film and print archives digitized so that they can be made use of and passed on. Uh, but I always just shot a lot of pictures just, you know, in that sort of classic street photography way. Um, oftentimes of my family, uh, my daughters were very patient subjects. Um, here's uh, my, my nephew, a lot of time in the old Volkswagen camper. Huh. Um, I really loved the old uh, Contacts G2 with with either the 21 or the 28, usually the 21 on it, and it, it was a <clears throat> fabulous camera. Um, and let's see, Zoom wanted to take over my screen. So let's see if we can get back to Keynote. There we go. Um, you mean the 35 millimeter Contacts? Uh, there they are. Yeah, it was the 35 millimeter contacts, the G2 with the uh, 21 Biogon and uh, loved, uh, have always loved panoramas getting inside pictures, having the picture be around me um, and looking for those real moments. Like I said, my daughters were, were very, uh, were, were nice willing subjects. Uh, and then this is, this is a part of a series that I did for 16 years, shooting my kids and my nieces and nephews up at a mountain house that our family has. And uh, we, we continued it until they went off to college and now uh, we can't get them back in the same place. But I love how photography lets us travel through time and lets us revisit those times and being able to digitize and unlock. Now, the, this was obviously a digital original, or, or maybe not obviously, but it was a digital original. Um, yeah, so now with, with everything being digital, I mean, what's happened to the family album? Well, it's, uh, it's gone digital, um, but the... You know, it's a thing I've been been um, investigating a lot, and I've gone to a bunch of the trade shows about this, and there's a lot of overlap in the cultural heritage space. And 
there, you know, there aren't really good long-term solutions yet. Uh, there's a, there's one that's pretty interesting called memory web that uh, allows crowdsourcing of both the um, submission of material and then also the annotation of the material. But, you know, the, so much of, of what's there is distributed knowledge. And so it's, I think it's, it's a huge challenge and it's actually one of the things that we've uh, worked on really hard with Tandem Vault uh, is to, to make a centralized place that everybody can contribute, collaborate and, uh, and tag and help you, you know, help this become a repository of knowledge, which I think is really what we should be looking for in our photo collections. Um, move, moving here into uh, some of my commercial work. Uh, I had the uh, great privilege of working for PBS for a, a whole bunch of years, um, shooting real people. This is really a, a girl with Tourette syndrome. This is really her bedroom. Um, and she was inspired by Downton Abbey to become a writer. Uh, this is uh, a woman who learned to speak Spanish as a kid watching Sesame Street in Mexico. And then when she moved to the US, she um, uh, learned to speak English watching Sesame Street in the US. And she became a children's book illustrator and did a book with uh, Michelle Obama. Um, really, really wonderful lady. Um, guy who made a film for PBS about uh, what it's like to be Muslim in America. Guy who saw Ken Burns National Parks and, and rode his bike from Florida to Denali. And we took him uh, up into the mountains of uh, Washington State. Um, professor who, this is, this is part of a slightly different campaign. This is on uh, planned giving. Can Peter, I go back to the guy that took his bicycle from Florida to Denali? Yeah. How long was that? Many months. <laughs> And he, he is a nutty guy. Um, I really liked no. him, but he definitely no. had like kind of a screw loose. <laughs> no, no. Um, why would you say something like that? Yeah, uh, really, really sweet guy though. Um, it's Peter Sagel. Uh, if you hear him on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, wonder what mm -hmm. he looked like. Uh, he did a program for, on the constitution. Uh, Gwen Eiffel, who I got to photograph a whole bunch of times and she was just fabulous. I really really loved her. I, and I really loved what happened with digital where all of a sudden you didn't need to drag lights around. You know, I've got, I've got a storage room filled with cases of strobes that I no longer have to take with me and, and can shoot wide open and um, let people be themselves. Uh, another part, another one for that planned giving campaign. And I think you can see a lot of the, the sort of echoes of my personal work mm -hmm. in that work. Uh, I did, did a couple of projects for uh, an organization in South Africa. Um, this this uh, organization helps to feed and educate and provide guidance for people in a, in a pretty poor town. And they wanted some pictures to help tell the story. So I was was pleased to go and, and do that actually yeah. took my, uh, my daughter along and we made a film about their works in um, fetal alcohol syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you transition from this to the damn book? Well, that happened a lot earlier, it, uh, right as digital was coming of age. Um, Dave Harp, who was president of ASMP tapped me to be the head of the digital standards and practices um, committee, which was kind of a weird leap of faith. I didn't really know him that well. And it would, I didn't really, you know, I had no portfolio to speak of um, only, a, you know, sort of a passing uh, familiar, familiarity with digital. And uh, that led me over to Adobe, uh, John Knack and Russell Brown in particular. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I worked at Adobe in. for 20 years. Yeah, and and they they brought me in as uh, as an alpha tester back when that was like a particular real thing. <laughs> uh, and I, I got to meet Jeff, um, and uh, and then about halfway through that product cycle, I figured, well, who's going to write this? Like Seth is obviously going to write this book, 
And and then I realized that the the Adobe Bridge team was looking at me, and so I said, okay, let's let's give it a shot. And and Russell helped me get it published with O'Reilly, and then it was just off like a rocket. The next few years were, you know, uh, five or six countries and thirty or forty cities a year. Mm-hmm. of just requests coming in over the transom to yeah so you're on the third edition of the book now yes i am so um in this latest one uh you have chapter one is photography has become a new common language spoken by nearly everyone for nearly every purpose can you talk about that as we're looking at these photos sure um so you know this thing that just happened primarily because of the smartphone is that photography became uh, not just a thing that people would consume um, occasionally uh, and 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 maybe poorly, maybe not really understand exactly what they're looking at to a to a thing where everybody became a photographer and was using it for almost anything. And you know we see this now. i I had to get a you know replacement parts for a lock in my house, and the you know the woman at the Schlage customer service will send me a picture and and it really you know it's everything from the banal um all the way up to the exquisite and i see people like my my kids who grew up with the expectation that there will always be a photo you know if if pixar it didn't happen if there's not a photo it didn't happen Mm -hmm. right and um and also that those photos would be connected objects they would be connected to um, to other people, to other ideas, um, uh, and available on the web instantly. You know, we like looking at the uh, gray hair uh, in this crowd. <laughs> um, you know, we think about how much work it was to get things published, and and now you know you can instantly publish worldwide, and it it's uh, it's a remarkable thing, um, and it it has changed the way we communicate um, all over the world. But I, I keep going back to the permanence of the digital. Uh, how many of us have had hard drive failures or lost images, lost files? Um, you know, so maybe, maybe we can touch a bit on your thoughts on storage and oh, uh, sure. that's a serious, backups. Serious problem. Major backups serious and, problem. Yeah. And your, yeah. Your thoughts um, on so a couple of things about that. To, I mean, I'll, I'll happily answer questions in yeah. whatever sequence they come at me. Um, you know, it's important to realize that storage is a process, not a thing you can put your stuff in and just leave alone. And and that's true for for physical archives. You know, if you're not air conditioning and humidity controlling, that film's going to rot and, um, you know, maybe become stuck to whatever it's been stored in. The the advantage, of course, with digital is that it's incredibly cheap and easy. Um, I just stopped the share for a moment. We can go okay. back to it. Yeah, no problem. Um, talk. It's it's uh, become incredibly cheap and easy. Uh, I'm I'm sort of blind here now. I can't <laughs> see anybody. If I uh, stop the share, uh, all right. Well, I'll speak. I'll speak blindly. Um, <laughs> but wait a minute. We can see. Um, you. Yep. It okay. is. It's not cheap, it's easy, but it's less expensive. Cheap well, annotates. I mean, if you think about all the equipment that you have to you have to buy in order to do digital, uh, the, the, the onset or the, the initial um, uh, outlay is uh, well, okay, so I'm specifically talking about storage. So I'm comparing the storage mechanisms and processes and software. As opposed with, to a, as opposed with, to a shoebox? Uh, a shoebox is not going to work. Uh, in, you know, in my case, uh, the room I'm sitting in here right now was filled with light tables and filing cabinets. I but had in to, the old days, a shoebox was it. Well, yeah, I mean, not for a professional collection and, and storing a shoebox worth of photos is trivially cheap and easy right now storing the you know millions of photos that a, a prolific photographer may have is the challenge and um, 
So, you know, on one hand, in the physical world, you had, you had equipment, furniture, a room to put it in, temperature and humidity control. Um, it, it was not cheap to do. And today, large drives are extremely reliable and very affordable. You know, they, the drives, if you're using a bunch of like one terabyte drives, it's time to upgrade. You should be using relatively modern drives. And right now for what, 400 bucks or so, you can get 14, 16 terabytes, something like that. Uh, so that is a tremendous amount of photography that can be stored on, you know, ideally say triplicate of, of that um, for, so for a thousand bucks, 1200 bucks, you can store a lifetime of photography, depending on, you know, what kind of camera you're using and, and what kind of formats you're shooting and, and what you're saving. But it's, um, I, I would say it's cheap compared to certainly what I was looking at at the damn book one phase where the processes of juggling things around and dealing with the fact that hard drives were, you know, 60 gigabytes or something like that. Um, so when we're talking about hard drives, we're talking about spinning platters, not SS SSDs right now at that. Price yeah. Rate. I mean, for, for large collections, spinning disc is really still the sweet spot. The, um, SSDs are fine for smallish collections. They they just aren't as affordable when, you know, if you're going into the, you know, tens or hundreds of terabytes. Mm -hmm. um, and and they have gotten uh, spinning disk has gotten a lot faster on the high end. That when you get up into that like fourteen sixteen um, range they actually have multiple read heads inside the same drive. So it's like two turntables inside the same record <laughs> player. And um, that can actually double the throughput of the data coming off of the drive. And the other thing that, that doubles or that, that increases as the drive gets larger is what they call the aerial density. So the, one of the limitations of a hard drive is how many bits that read head can pass over as the drive is spinning. And as they pack those bits tighter together, the same 7,200 RPMs of spinning is passing over many, many, many more bits. And so it can actually read much faster. So you're starting to get speeds that, that look kind of like SSD speeds coming out of spinning disk. Um, and, and they are quite reliable. Uh, you know, that having been said, every hard drive is out to get you. Sure. And, Anything that you have only on one hard drive is a thing you don't mind losing today. So we're starting ah. to get a bunch of things in the chat here. Uh, yeah. David Julian is saying he'd love to touch on recommendations for NAS recommendations for two computer setups, 10 to 20 terabytes. Are there brands or models or anything that you could talk about to that? Um, so here's my first recommendation, which is the general one. Uh, so NAS NAS boxes our network attached storage mm -hmm. um, is a little computer inside something that looks like a hard drive enclosure. It's running Linux. And if you're not comfortable administering a Linux system, you should be thinking hard about whether you want that or not. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers the heart bleed bug that um, was a uh, a, a kind of a big deal, uh, maybe six years ago, and it was um, open source uh, verification of uh, identity and data transfer that it turned out was in like every single Linux thing, but also like it, it's widely, you know, was widely used by, by, you know, when by Microsoft and by Apple and uh, when the Heartbleed bug became public, it became essential to update all of your software. And so if, you know, if you're running Apple, you just get that update notice and you 
push the button and you're fine. Windows, you're updating your software all the time anyway. Um, and or your operating system. Uh, if you have a NAS box, you've got to go deal with that. And people had real problems um, with the NAS box. So, you know, my, my general recommendation for most photographers is if you're not um, good with Linux, if that doesn't make sense to you, and if you don't have, you know, a good tech person or company on staff, you're better off repurposing an old computer with an operating system that you're familiar with and attaching an array of drives to it. Um, personally, I, I like the uh, other world computing, four bay, Mercury, something like that. It's a USB three. Um, it's a great, uh, you know, it's a, like $250 or $300 enclosure that holds four drives. You can pop four um, 16 terabyte drives in there and have a massive array of storage. Plug it straight into either your main computer or if you really want it available over a network, another computer doesn't have to be that fast that um, is sitting out on your network. So it's a little bit of a sideways recommendation. Mm -hmm. Now, if you if you are familiar with Linux and you want to administer, uh, you know, internal Linux system, then there are a number of different choices out there. But you know, once we start into that, we're talking about potential questions of different scale as well. So Alan Shapiro is saying, what's the difference between a network attached storage and a RAID? Yeah. So so RAID is also um, multiple drives connected by an operating system, um, probably Linux, uh, that's, that's running on a chip inside that RAID box. And so multiple drives can be made to act like one single drive. And uh, most NAS um, devices allow you to... Uh, to raid the drives inside the NAS. So, so NAS has like an extra layer of logic and applications sitting on top of a RAID controller. Um, I, you know, again, I, I go back to this, <laughs> like people think that the complex thing is the thing that's going to be good for them. Um, you know, if uncorrectable parity error sounds like gobbledygook to you, you're probably not the person who should be uh, administering a raid and either you get somebody to do it who knows what they're doing and you can call and you will refrain from touching your device when there's <laughs> some kind of a hiccup or or a problem um, uh, or if you can get by with individual drives that are well backed up it's a it's a good solution it's a it's in my view the ideal solution for most uh sole practitioner photographers or you know very small shops two or three people in a shop basically Here. avoid raid well you know raid was necessary because we needed large volumes back when you know we needed a large large size inside a single bucket mm -hmm. and you know drives were 60 gigabytes and you you know, you might not be able to put your whole shoot on that. You can now do that on a, um, uh, on just a regular, you know, single spinning disc. Uh, the other reason people needed RAID, and particularly this was in video land, was mm -hmm. they needed fast throughput. And uh, if you want fast, like for your working files, get a decent sized SSD, it's going to, you know, kick the ass of any RAID in terms of throughput, especially for small files. It's simple. Um, they're, you know, they won't break if they fall off a table. You're not adding an extra layer of system administration on top of it. So, you know, the ideal thing is an SSD for your working files. Make it a big one, like a you know two or four terabytes. They're very affordable now. Um, spinning disk for uh, nearline and archive. Um, get big ones, 
have twins of them, ideally triple triplets of them, and one of them lives off site. And if you know if you can do that, you're extremely well protected. So David was adding on to his. I thought that most of NAS, like Synology and Netgear, etc., all come with software that initializes and monitors once it's set up. Uh, it it does, and that first month you probably have no issues. Um, the the problem, the issue is, you know, if you're buying a solution that you expect to use for five years, which these days, you know, given the size of drives, you can absolutely buy some drives, buy uh, an enclosure for it, and expect to get a good five years out of it. Um, you will be updating the OS depending periodically. Upon the, depending upon the quality of the actual physical drives you put in, I would highly recommend enterprise drives, not your standard run-of-the-mill hard drives. Yeah, the, the if you get a, uh, enterprise... hard drive with a five-year warranty, that means that the manufacturer is really sure that the odds are that most of the drives will not fail in five years. So yeah, the, the, worst, the worst drives going through quality control are the ones that end up in the boxes at Best Buy. And, um, you know, one of the things that I think is a good um, development is that you now have uh, the hard drive manufacturers partnering directly with the high quality uh, enclosure people. And they actually target them to media people. So the GTEC line uh, owned by Hitachi, and I guess that's now SanDisk, um, they, they not only are, are giving you a good enclosure <laughs> and being responsible for it and saying this is built for media use, but they're putting a drive inside that has, uh, should, you know, generally they're not going to tell you this in advertising, but the people I know who work in the industry tell you that, you know, the, that will not be the bottom of the barrel of, hey, it just passed quality control testing. It will be a, you know, a good quality drive inside an enclosure if you're buying it inside an enclosure already. Um, the, uh, it, it's probably worth a little bit of extra money for an enterprise drive. It usually, you know, oftentimes, like if you go look at B and H, they're they're sort of ten percent, maybe twenty percent um, more expensive. Uh, again, every hard drive is out to get you, so you need to make sure you have a good backup that would be easy to swap into service if the main one goes down. Do you have any thoughts on Drobo? Marsh is asking. Um. So if you have a Drobo and it's working fine, um, great. If you're thinking about a new purchase, then uh, I, again, just like RAID or NAS, it's it's just a, you know, it's a- I see a lot of thumbs downs from- It's essentially a, a NAS box. Don't, don't fucking put data on a Drobo. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not- um, the the reason for Drobo's existence initially was people needed a large storage volume, and you couldn't do that with a single drive. Well, now for you know a couple of hundred bucks, you can buy a drive that's fourteen or sixteen terabytes, and so, uh, so the the need for the Drobo is significantly less. That puts economic pressure on the company. They've had some ups and downs over the years, um, some you know real downs at times, uh, and probably a number of people here who are giving the thumbs down <laughs> are are ones who have either direct or or very near near miss experience with having a machine go down. Yeah. And um, again, it's an operating system that you don't know anything about that's doing a lot of tricks and um and it's not necessary it's an additional level of complexity that just introduces more in my view more possibility for error asterisk here for 
your archived files, which basically should be put away and shouldn't be changed. Um, that's different than works in progress. And I'll, I'll tell you what I think you should do with works <laughs> in progress next. But really, you know, when we're talking about this big storage, we're talking about the bulk of your archive, the most of those files, which should be put away. And, um, you know, especially if you're a raw file photographer, like all changes to that file are bad. So you want to have a system where you put that stuff away and you don't mess with it. You can, you know, spin off two other copies, take one over to John's house, keep it in his closet and, mm -hmm. you know, periodically update it. So Chris Gallegos is saying that cloud is his best friend. And Rick Ernst is saying um, he stores his archives on one terabyte hard drives. He'd like to understand the risks involved in using the cloud as a backup. And his archive spans maybe 40 years of film and digital. Should he upgrade his current one TB drives to newer and bigger drives and forget the cloud? So absolutely. That's the easy one. Um, if you're using one terabyte drives, especially if they're the larger 3.5 inch drives, you're using really old drives. And uh, it, there's a couple of reasons, a couple of things that they're old, they're slow. They probably have some reliability, um, statistical, you know, reliability problems. Um, and uh, the other thing is it's super hard to verify them, you know, if I've got 16 hard drives that are one terabyte sitting on a shelf and I periodically want to just make sure they're spinning, that's 16 different drives. I've got to hook up to a computer and see whether they're, they're working. Whereas if I have one 16 terabyte drive, I'm, I'm just verifying that that's working. So multiple least, copies of that. Right. Three yes, copies yes. of anything you care about keeping. Um, and then the other thing I was going to say is that you want to talk about bit rot. Just um, if you have something stored <laughs> on a hard drive, doesn't mean that you're going to be able to plug it in, turn it on, and boot it, uh, because um, uh, data actually can rot. Uh, plus, yeah, you have so, that problem with uh, operating systems. Yeah, so you can have um, bit flipping, uh, also known as bit rot, where bits change in files. If you're a Lightroom user and if you use DNG, you have an awesome tool to uh, check for bit rot that doesn't really exist anywhere else in the world of computing. Uh, there's a, a verification checksum that's written inside every DNG that refers to that part of the file that never changes. It's never supposed to change. Mm -hmm. And you can, with one button in Lightroom, say, go recompute that checksum for my entire archive. And it will tell you whether any bits have flipped in any of your DNG files. You can, you know, I periodically run it on, you know, a hundred thousand, hundreds of thousands of files at a time. So where is that in Lightroom? Uh, it's... Um, if you save as a DNG, it's automatically mm -hmm. doing this, okay. and it's in the library menu, uh, verify DNGs. Cool. It also, um, uh, um, they check that checksum each time you open a file in the develop module. Mm -hmm. And if you ever get a thing that says, like, there was an error or an, you know something unexpected, and you still may be able to use the file just fine. It may have been like one pixel, you know, one mm -hmm. bit has flipped and it's changed one pixel. Um, so, so it's doing it along the way, but anytime you find there's an error, you really want to track it down. Yeah. That's only for DNG. It's only for DNG. And it's as you know, you can, there are tools, um, to verify any file type by running checksums on them. Uh, but they're, you know, it's super hard to do. It's it's easy. It's dead simple to do with a free application once, and but it's super hard to do that and be organized and be able to maintain it in the long term. We so, kind of skipped over the cloud part of this question. So now. cloud cloud is uh, is incredibly important. So uh, I was not skipping. I was was yeah, dealing I with just what I make sure was that... easy part first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Cloud, you know, first of all, cloud means somebody else's computer. 
And there are some particularly great uses of cloud. So I'll, well, I'll tell you what the most important ones for me. Number one is protection of my works in progress on any computer I've got that's got you know, files that haven't been put away in their permanent home in the archive. So that includes the laptop I'm, I'm on right now. It includes my wife's laptop that runs the business. It actually includes my kids' laptops. Um, and then uh, another processing machine here. Uh, all of those I'm using Backblaze with, and it's uh, 60 bucks a year, and it's awesome. It automatically, continuously backs up everything on your computer, and it, it does um, client-side encrypting. So it, it actually encrypts the files on your machine and then sends it up to the cloud. And uh, only your ID and your account can decrypt those files. Uh, when, my, when my daughter went off to college, you know, I gave her a backup hard drive. It's like, it would be terrible if my daughter lost her computer, you know, lost <laughs> her. Of course, she never used it. She called me in tears one day. She had poured a, you know, pitcher of water, was pouring a glass of water, and, and all the water went all over her keyboard. And, you know, she had an important assignment due the next day. I was able to sign into the Backblaze account, pull out the autosave of the Microsoft Word file from her Backblaze account and then send it to her phone and she could submit it. Uh, and so it's just automatically doing this in the background. Right. It's a, it's a fabulous application. Uh, there's there's a couple others. Carbonite is another one. I, I've got a lot of experience with Black Backblaze. I I really like it. It also what's it called, what's it called again? It's back called Blaze. Back, Backblaze. Backblaze. B l a z e. Yeah. yeah, and it's and it's uh, sixty bucks per computer. Theoretically, any size of drive, and including multiple external drives, can can go on a same account. Uh, terms of service are such that a professional photographer with a 60 terabyte archive is not uh, um, eligible for the $60 a year plan, but I've never heard of them coming after anybody. Um, so it's, you know, and if they do, then you can say, all right, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll either pay the real fee or, um, uh, or I'll, you know, go find something else. But uh, it it's just dead simple. It happens in the background. I'd love it uh, for when I'm traveling. Uh, one day I'll be able to travel again. And, yeah. you know, so it can be backing up continuously from wherever you are. Uh, it You do have to watch out if you're tethering with your phone and you like download a big shoot that you don't try and upload, you know, a couple of hundred gigabytes or, <laughs> you know, kill kill your uh, bandwidth um, or your your data plan on your phone yeah um, but it, it's a really good one the other the other place where cloud is super important is um, is distribution and you know this this circles back around to the idea of uh, photography is this language that we're all speaking and people expect to have access to the photos from wherever Um whether it's me to me sharing my computer to my phone or whether it's, um, you know, me with a group uh, and, and the, you know, all of that, that, that by definition is the cloud. That means it's coming in over the internet. And you, one of the things you see is that in general, um, even businesses with full-time IT people don't want to be running software on their own servers that allows strangers to dial in, um, you know, to, to um, log in. So the way they get around that is use third-party services. And, and that's really, I mean, that's the way that software is being designed these days is third-party services that bolt together. And, you know, we're, we're using one right here. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, so the, cloud part, which, you know, Photo Shelter was a huge pioneer of that. 
of the ability to have a good online space with dedicated um, workflow tools built for photographers. Uh, and, you know, they, they put a whole bunch of things under one roof, portfolio, um, job delivery, stock sales, um, and then eventually even archive. You can, you can archive your entire, you can store your entire archive with Photo Shelter Pro Plan um, is unlimited data. So you could pop that 60 terabytes up to, it wouldn't be a pop, it would be more like a <laughs> long mark. Yeah. Um, to push 60 terabytes up to a Photo Shelter Pro account. And so for, you know, I think that's five or 600 bucks a year these days. Mm -hmm. um, for a for a photographer with a valuable archive, that's one of the very best ways that you could add cloud storage to mm -hmm. um, to your you know your whole storage uh, setup. Yeah. So going back to spinning disks um, and storing offsite, someone was asking if it's a problem to store them on their sides or tilted when they're not running. You know, um, disks used to be pretty finicky um about being stored uh um and not used they're you know they're basically designed for usage um i don't think there's a a different uh, any kind of a problem with with the orientation of the disk in storage uh the you know more important thing is that you periodically you know at least like once a year Anyway, <laughs> pull pull those out and make sure they still fire up. Um, disc discs fail at the time of boot up. Uh, many many a, a much larger factor of times than um, failing in the middle of actually just working. So sure, that, a lot of electronics is thing. that way. It's the power yeah. surge turning yep. it on. It's yeah. like light bulbs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Melissa is asking if you had a preferred brand of SSD, if you can talk to that. And Rick is saying, does anyone see the solid state external drives going the way the CD becoming extinct in the future? Solid state drives becoming extinct? Um, I'm solid state. Well, okay. Uh, I typically buy, first question, I typically buy uh, SanDisk or Samsung. Um and you know, good reputable manufacturers that unlike a hard drive, uh, you know, you can definitely bootleg and pirate um, solid state memory. It's just you're buying chips and you put them together in a fab in China and or Taiwan or sorry um, Thailand. Uh, but so by by a good reputable one like. Um, and, and there's a couple of others, but I, my own personal preference is SanDisk, Samsung. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sorry, SanDisk and, well, Samsung, yeah. Yeah. That's what I've been buying. Yeah. Um, what's, what's your and, reaction to Micron? I uh, don't have an opinion. And, you know, I, again, every, every one of these things is out to get you. So it's, it's <laughs> mm -hmm. nice if you're, you know, spread it out. Um, in terms of whether they're going to go away, I mean, they, you know, they, they effectively have a connection port, which is, is a standard connection port. So just as with any digital storage, the idea is that you're going to migrate it off of what it's currently on into whatever the new thing is that's storage is a process and and so i would say that you know the danger of uh ssds especially like with a you know a sata connection um it's going to be readable long past the point at which you're you know laughing at <laughs> two terabytes of storage when you're like what no i, I have you know a petabyte drive here <laughs> that that thing's still going to be um uh still going to be readable uh, i will say that for working files one of the things um a little geeky you want to 
if you have um, a Thunderbolt connection, uh, if you get an SSD that is marked as NVMe, um, those are the ones that are super fast. So the uh, regular SSD might be 600 gigabits per second. Um, and, and then an NVMe could be like 3000. Um, oh. now when are you ever going to see that difference? Uh, when you're downloading huge shoots, are you going to ever see it in your actual workflow? Probably not. There's, there's very little regular photo workflow where the thing that is slowing you down is, is, you know, 600 megabit storage. So another question is bite rod or bit flip a deal a, a present in the cloud. Um, so here's the thing about somebody else's computer is that there's, um, there's essentially, except around the edges, there's not really a good way to verify that the bits that you, that left your computer are the ones that you would be getting back. And the issue is that there could be a problem in many different places in the pipeline. You know, it could be in your ethernet router or the cable that your computer is connected to, or it could be in the cloud service itself, either storing or retrieving. So, um, the, you know, in the, uh, in the cultural heritage space, they have, uh, they have some schemes for verifying, uh, files as stored that can't be spoofed. But, um, you know, if you have a checksum, that checksum is a little 32 digit, um, code that that's what you get once you, you know, run all the, all the ones and zeros through mm -hmm. an equation. And if one or if any one or zero changes, you get a whole different 32 digit number at the end. Um, well, you can compute those checksums, but um, how do you know that your cloud service is actually recomputing it rather than just sending you back the checksum you had before? And, and cloud compute is expensive. So it's one of the things that, <clears throat> you know, you, you pay for storage but you definitely pay for compute and throughput to, to have those files be retrieved within the cloud system, the checksums regenerated and checked against the stored checksum. Um, that's a thing that costs money. And so you don't really have certainty. And, and one of the things that I believe is very, very hard to get around in the visible time horizon is that if you care about your stuff, you need a copy of it on a device in your possession. And that's, that's to me, that's like a non-negotiable. And I'm saying that as the architect of a cloud service. <laughs> um, there's just, there's too many unknowns and, and it's just too cheap to do that these days, you know, you can, what, whatever the size of your data is, if it's important enough for you to keep, it's important enough for you to buy storage for. Mm -hmm. and, how do and services, how do services like Box or Dropbox compared to Backblaze and these other dedicated? Um, so it's important to, to look at what services are designed for to, to try and understand what they're doing. And, you know, Backblaze, is and carbonite though those have very clear use cases which is we're continuously backing up your stuff and we'll give it back to you if your drive fails or your computer gets stolen so they're just that's what that's what they do you could you could try and make a file share out of it but it you'd be unhappy um box and drop dropbox they're, you know, they're good working file share applications. Um, they tend to come apart at scale. 
um, too many people or too many files on your box or Dropbox. And oh, all of a sudden, it's just a giant mess that can't be sorted out. Um, so, and then the other thing about Box and Dropbox is that, you know, they're really designed around the idea that uh, this is something that's in flux. You know, we're sharing a Word document or we're sharing an InDesign document. Um, and so their, their um, permission scheme, you know, it's, I compare this to like what we're designing at Tandem Vault, which, which I call library software rather than file sharing software, which is you've got a place, you've deposited a copy of the media object of the media of the file and um, people can borrow it and take it out but people the most of the people who have access to it can't uh, change it or delete it and box and dropbox by the very nature of what they're attempting to do as an application leave you open to the possibility that somebody will make a mistake and delete files that happens all the time you know so oh my dropbox is full i'm just going to go delete all this stuff well it turns out you deleted it for everybody else too um so that's a you know that's a huge problem as well as as you change files so um the biggest security problem with with all of this is human behavior and uh but using a system for something it's not designed for is where you're just asking for trouble. So when you say box or Dropbox, like, what are you trying to do? You know, for us, it's essential when I'm writing books and my editors in Laos and, you know, I finish writing a chapter and send her a Slack message and then go to bed and I get up in the morning and she's edited the chapter and, and either, you know, made a new file or changed the old file and sent me a Slack message back. Um, so awesome for that would definitely not use it to, and I, I would use it to distribute files maybe if I didn't have a better way, but it's not, it's not great for file distribution just because it's not very well protected it's, and it's not transparent who's accessed stuff. So tell us more about Tandem Vault. Um, um, so it's a, uh, well, I, first thing I, I, my first, aside from the work with Adobe, my first hand in product work was working at Photo Shelter building uh, what was called Libris is now called Photo Shelter for Brands. It's like Photo Shelter for Companies. And um, that was great. I enjoyed doing it. Uh, eventually, the commute to New York was just too much. And so uh, so I wrote Dan Book 3 kind of as a blueprint for what the next version of the software would be. And, and I was working um, at a communications firm here in DC as the uh, director of digital strategy. And I selected Tandem Vault as the cloud system that we were going to use to share this heritage materials for the clients. They have a great range of clients, you know, Southwest Airlines and Verizon and Morgan Stanley and a bunch of, bunch of great companies. Um, and Tandem Vault was the one that offered the best price and um, set of options for that kind of work. Uh, when that contract ended with that company, I went out and said, you know, I could make your software a lot better if you let me, if you just do what I say. And, and then I showed them and they're like, okay, yeah, do that. And so I've been working on that for about 14 months and we've built um, what I think is a, just an, a wonderful application for uh, particularly for photo uh, libraries. Um, we have, um, great taxonomy tools, great collection tools, great collaboration tools. So you can, you know, have comment threads within, um, within your light boxes that you're sharing with other people. Very, very good tools for adding groups, um, all built around, um, institutional needs at the moment. So companies, uh, 
universities, uh, nonprofit institutions, who the current customer customer base is. And you know, one of the things that that you know, all of my work has been about what do I want that I don't see out there? And one of the things I wanted that is not out there is multi-user Lightroom library access. And so we've taken a lot of the features of Lightroom's, not the develop module, but the, um, the file organization and metadata and built it as a multi-user tool. And the other thing was iView Media Pro. Any anybody old iView user? Long time uh, ago. Still, still an iView user. No. I know there's some people out there. Um, all the guys at the Geographic are like freaking because they're not going to be able to launch iView anymore. Um, anyway, so we took a lot of functionality out of that, and we've we've put it into what we call Tandem Vault Three, which is in late beta, is about to about to launch. And um, I, I think we've got the best uh, in the in the sub six figure application um, space for you know attaching contracts and model releases and good rights information to files uh, to accept crowdsource files and tag them properly and tag them properly with rights. Um, really want to help the um, the institutional communications people to not violate the contracts and copyrights they have. And, and right now, they're just really terrible tools for somebody sorting that out. You know, if once Janet is no longer there, and she knew what every contract was, and who, you know, who shot all these pictures, and which ones we should never use, you know, once she's gone, then, hey, it's just free for all, giant hard drive full of stuff. Of course, we can use those. Um, so let's see some of the other things coming in chat here as we reach the top of the hour. John Shields is saying recommendations about keywording, your own custom keywords versus pur purchase libraries. Um, uh, very clear preference for my own keywords. And the reason is that the stuff that's most important to me will never show up in a library. It's the people, events, places, um, uh, the specific material that's inside my collection. And uh, the, those, those libraries are typically built for somebody who wants to do stock photography and have their, their material integrate directly with stock photo libraries. Um, that's becoming less important, I think, from a general usage standpoint. The, the stock photography sales is, you know, it, it's, it's less important. Mm -hmm. So Marsha is following up on Tandem Vault for small groups of photographers. She's a group of three. Uh, where are you at? Um, we are looking for beta testers. If uh, somebody's interested in <laughs> playing around, uh, you can contact me directly. <laughs> um, you know, I think in our initial rollout, you know, we're at a, a hundred bucks a month uh, is our base price. We go up to, you know, a $60,000 a year account, but um, it's, I would like to get to the point where I could say that this is a thing we can offer to photographers right now. Just the economics of the thing is it's, it's built and priced for institutional corporate use. Um, but, you know, it turns out that the people who are good at putting these things together are people who are good at managing a photo archive. And oftentimes that's a photographer. And, and so you know, I'm, I'm definitely interested in talking to people who might want to um, play around and, and kick the tires and, and see where it works and see where, mm -hmm. where things are unclear. Okay, so Stephen is asking if you have thoughts on the new M.2 NVMe RAIDs offered by OWC using Soft RAID or products like OWC Thunderblade and Excelsior. For M2, <laughs> I'm really worried about software based RAID. Yeah, I mean, what why do you need RAID on NVMe? It's you know, you're getting 
you're getting uh, 3,000 megabits and, uh, or is it megabytes? Uh, I'm confused. <laughs> um, anyway, it's, you're getting massive throughput. Why do you need to have this extra level of complexity of having these things uh, joined together? Like give, and, and I say that as a question, like why? There, there could be a reason, but there probably isn't. Steve is saying for super large volumes and super large volumes that need to be super fast. Hardware raid, not software raid. Well, but even, even so, like, when do you need, you know, give me the use case for why you need all of, um, whatever, 10 terabytes of, of data to be transferred really fast. Why, why do you need that? You know, most operations that you're doing are processor bound, not uh, IO bound, not, not, they're not slowed down by the input output. They're slowed down by what the processor can do. So Lightroom, the thing that you're waiting on all the time is uh, the chip in your computer to decode um, that image and to apply corrections to it. The, the reading of the image is like one one hundredth of a second. And then if you're waiting for like four seconds, what you're waiting for there is your processor, not your storage. So it, it, would, be a, it would be a really unusual, I mean, there certainly could be, but it would be a really unusual, you know, you're, you're doing like complex 3D um, multiprocessor things on, on a, you know, an array of computers that are all tethered together uh, or that have, you know, 50 different video cards all running in tandem. It's, it's an overbuilt solution, unless you know why, unless you can tell me why you need it in that volume at that speed. So Chris is asking, is RAID strictly for redundancy? So it's either redundancy. Um, you can have mirrored RAID where there's, let's say there's multiple drives in an enclosure and the same thing is written to both. And the, the protection there is that one of the devices could fail and the other could still have the data on it. And so for critical data where there is no additional second copy, uh, mirrored RAID makes sense. Um, as opposed to striped. Except for Stri anything that happens on the primary drive is mirrored to the secondary drive. So if you get corruption on the primary drive, not a failure, but corruption, that corruption is automatically mirrored on the backup drive. Yeah. I so hate mirrored drives. Personally. So the, the only, th yeah, the only thing it protects you from is device failure, not, and, and device failure within the drive mechanism itself. It doesn't. Yeah doesn't help you against like bad RAM in your computer or a bad cable or a bad logic board in the raid box, you know, the, or, or been, human error. I've been, I've been bitten by uh, mirrored. I don't mirror. Yeah. It, there's a, there's an advantage to separating things in space and time a bit. Mm -hmm. And One of so the things that I do is I use a carbon copy cloner and I do a backup every night of my internal hard drive to my backup hard drive for applications and system. I do my primary RAID backed up to my secondary RAID. And then after that, my secondary RAID is backed up to my tertiary RAID. So I've got three RAIDs online at all time. And then I've got a fourth copy, uh, which is in my daughter's apartment down on the south side of Chicago that I swap out, not on a regular basis, but you know, once every couple of, once a quarter. So, so I've there's, got a, four copies. there's a, a good reason to use an application um, called Chronosync rather than Carbon Copy Cloner. And the reason is it allows for a verified transfer. Essentially what it does is it hashes the file um, before copying, then it copies it, and then it re rereads the file 
and hashes it and compares the two hashes and they need to uh, match exactly. Otherwise, uh, without doing without doing copying in that method, it's possible that there's a network error or a RAM error or some other error is introduced when it's copied from one place to the other. You know, the, the operating system is doing a pretty good check to make sure that the copy is exactly or is, is the same as the source. It's doing a pretty good check, but it's not doing a bit for bit compare. And the advantage of using Chronosync is that um, it does that bit for bit compare and it will be the canary in the coal mine for you. Uh, if it throws an error and says uh, there was a file mismatch between these two, then you know, un unless it makes sense to you why there is uh, that mismatch, um, like I was working on that file and probably changed it between the time it hashed it and the time it um, you know, copied it. Uh, it it's a it's a, a actually a super useful tool, and and I also use that application. Um, so I have all of the computers in my studio pointed at um, uh, a drive in my in my equipment closet that is the works in progress backup. Chronosync is just every night does kind of what Jeff was talking about, but only for the works in progress, not for the not for the archive itself. Um, but I also use that when downloading a shoot because it can tell you that your card reader or the working drive you're using out on location or the cable is having a problem and that the files did not copy properly. And, and I've had that happen probably, um, I think, I think only twice where, and when I say twice, I mean the drive was screwed up. Uh, and so it was, it, you know, it was multiple copies that were multiple files that were bad, but, um, in, in video land, this is extremely important and considered to be critical because you can't go visually look at every frame of your video is to hash the file on, on the source card and then do the copy and check, check the hash. John, one of the things I wanted to do is to, uh, personally and publicly thank Peter for all the work that he's done um, that a lot of people don't realize. <laughs> uh, when, you, when you work behind the scenes at Adobe, you get the, the um, power to influence direction. Uh, and uh, Peter has been this little irritating gnat in the ear of Thomas <laughs> Noel. <laughs> So part of the reasons that DNG Converter actually does a hash and uh, checksum on files is because Peter thought that that would be a good idea. And the thing about Thomas is if you can convince him that something is a good idea, he'll do it regardless of, because he has no boss, right, Peter? <laughs> yeah, so, so that uh, the checksum inside the DNG was a, a thing I came up with a guy named Mark Roshkind who uh, um, wrote uh, image ingester and image image verifier. And, and we were, we were really noodling this problem. Like, how do you know the thing that's on your card is, you know, that's in this place is, is in the next place. And I wrote to Thomas on a Christmas Eve. I still have the email string and said, Hey Thomas, how about this? And December 26, he wrote down and he wrote back and said, okay, it's done. Yeah, <laughs> that's the cool thing about Thomas. Yeah. Um, but then the other thing that uh, Peter has been useful for, uh, you've had some involvement with the Library of Congress yeah. uh, and the Copyright Office. Um, I posted a link, I don't know if anybody saw it, um, about the uh, sustainability, uh, seven factors for sustainability, the whole concept of digital objects uh, conservation and preservation. Uh, Peter has been very um, on the uh, one might say bleeding edge, if not leading edge, uh, because sometimes when you're starting in 
and where shit doesn't exist yet, you end up cutting yourself when you play with razor blades. <laughs> um, but the, the bottom line is Peter has been very helpful uh, for the entire industry. And a lot of people that have done this stuff, uh, they don't get the acknowledgement and the uh, um, accolades that they deserve. So Peter, congratulations. Uh, also to John, uh, John, you know, all the years that he was at Adobe uh, moderating the Photoshop forum, um, you know, he was helpful and instrumental uh, in kind of connecting users to engineers uh, until they got fired. Uh, I'm thinking about Chris Cox, Chris Cox. in particular, sadly. Um, but the bottom line is that there's a lot of stuff that is done behind the scenes back channel that have been very instrumental uh, to the industry. And for that, I thank both Peter and John. And fuck you, Newler, I thank you too. Because <laughs> on a different way, you work back channel. Um, so this is all kind of pat ourselves on the back time. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. Um, so sort of unreal. Kumbaya, my lord. <laughs> oh, fuck you. Kumbaya. <laughs> <laughs> Kumbaya, Michael. Uh, what are your thoughts on my on Mac OS Time Machine? Is that up to snuff? Um, it, it is, uh, for, it is definitely up to snuff for the user who can keep all of their stuff on one drive. Um, I have not checked it recently to see how well it does. Um, if you have a, you know, multi-drive archive and, um, I, it, it was limited, uh, at one point. And um, and also was limited at one point in your ability to make additional copies. Um, and for me, the the functionality of Time Machine is largely um, is largely performed in in my case by Backblaze because it does give you a thirty day rollback version. So if you were to delete a file you can go find it in Backblaze. Um, you know, you, you go onto the web and you um, say what day you want to see the snapshot of your hard drive and you go find that file and download it. What do you think of uh, the Apple M1? I'm afraid. And what I'm afraid of is that uh, I actually really like the way I have everything <laughs> set up here. And even though some of my hardware is kind of older, you know, we have a bunch of scanning stations that are connected to IMAX and, um, you know, the computer that runs the stereo and the computer that runs the printer, you know, old laptops that are, have new jobs. And I'm afraid that there's going to be an OS upgrade and, and, you know, Apple is notorious for then just making everything break. And, you know, you gotta, you gotta bring it all along with you. Um, yeah, that's where you don't want to be on the bleeding edge of anything. Yeah, they, you mean, they, you mean you're not still not using PowerPC Macs? What the I power still PC have two Mac. Power PC <laughs> right. Macs. Well, you know, look at it. It's not just it's it, you know every G generation you know that basically left it behind, and then the Intel, the early Intel Macs, the Core Two Duos, can't run anything close to a current operating system. And, and so, I mean, I, I am literally using right now a 2012 MacBook 13, which is our fleet machine here. It is a wonderful, you know, it's an i7 with 16 gigs of RAM and a big SSD in it. Super easy to swap drives. Um, I have chargers all over the house and <laughs> I don't, I have one of those also. <laughs> yeah. I've got like eight uh, of them. <laughs> you know, I do have a question. What's your current thought on converting to DNG? Like when <clears throat> or, or whether? If, if or when? Um, so if you um, love Capture One and <laughs> you want to use Capture One, then you obviously don't want to convert without embedding the raw and throw away the raw. Um, that's probably the biggest downside um, of early conversion. The 
biggest upside for early conversion is that you get the verification checksum first time you convert it and every place on the chain you have you know a, a one button app, uh, operation to say that the files ha are you know have full integrity so that's that's an advantage there i will I will say that what's happening particularly, and I write about this in the file formats chapter of the damn book. Um, in traditionally, you know, up until the real, real cloud revolution, the expectation of a file as being kind of a bucket of bits was a, a pretty reasonable structure to, to go, you know, to build upon. Um, these days, we have all of this complexity that is being used in visual communication that requires file formats that are designed openly to be able to, to accomplish this. And, you know, if you're an Apple, if you're an iPhone user and you uh, use the HEIF, um, you know, you, you realize that it can contain a video clip as well as a still image. Um, it also can contain a depth map that, that uh, tells you 3D information about your original scene and it saves it inside the file as an alpha channel. Um, and so, you know, what we're only starting to see applications that are starting to build upon that, but that's incredibly useful to know. To, to have your photograph not just be a rectangle full of color dots, but actually be uh, something that understands depth um, innately and has that saved in it. And it might have audio files and alternate renderings and a <laughs> different rendering for a different application. And, and so this is the way all the applications are being built. And the file formats need to be built to support this, otherwise, it's the wild west like video where you know there's there's no commonality in video formats and um i mean there's not no but it's 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 just a gigantic mess and video metadata is just a total mess the term and, clusterfuck comes to mind uh, you yes um <laughs> i'm allowed to say that you're not peter <laughs> um i can say fuck too um but uh <laughs> the uh the thing that that uh, Thomas in particular, and I, I think you got to give uh, Hogarty some credit and and some others uh, to just say, let's put the let's outline a really good standardized way to do these things that we know need to be or to attach these things we know need to be attached to our photographs, like the checksum that was very early, um, transparency depth information, all of this other stuff. Uh, images are, are only becoming, uh, you know, richer and richer media types. And so the file formats need to support that. And, you know, there's a, that thing that we were all afraid of back, you know, 20 years ago, that like the Kodak files, you can't ex access them anymore, because, because Kodak, you know, had a, had a, um, uh, a patented um, algorithm for decoding color and, and, you know, who real, who would have thought that the reason that you can't access the Kodak files is because Kodak isn't here anymore. Mm. Um, uh, and, you know, with, with them, they're, they're patented. That's a serious uh, problem that I uh, and, encountered and trying to get stuff off of photo CD. Yeah. Yeah. There's a good uh, PD, PCD magic is a good application yeah, I've for, got that. for doing that. Um, but, but that's a prime example of obsolescence of format. And, yeah, and, and and as and this now it's now it's even weirder because uh, because images are essentially smartphone native both in the creation but then also in the display. You know, th they use the uh, accelerometer to to allow you to sort of zoom around and to. Um, that you don't get the full feature of uh, many photos these days uh, unless you're looking at it on a smartphone. 
and that requires a whole bunch of you know components of the data object to be put in the file and and so you know the dngs way ahead of it um the heif is is good um it's an industry consortium um they have crappy compression um so it's you know it might it, you know it's a kind of thing that thomas would never let happen that this crappy compression is making the sky banned when you're you know as just part of a normal save is that like lucy compression what's that is that like lucy compression lucy compression <laughs> i suppose a yeah. crappy compression <laughs> it's it's pretty lucy <laughs> yeah. so let me, um, larry okay. was asking oh go ahead yeah thanks um like all of us i'm in a position of where um, if I had known then what I know now, uh, certainly I wouldn't be where I am now. And a lot of that has to do with keywording, archiving, backing up, putting it on, on cloud. I'm with Flutter Shelter also since Grover and Alan started it. Um, how do you, what, what is your recommendation for going back and getting everything organized duplicated, I have everything on two hard drives, everything's duplicated across two hard drives, and in the cloud. I, I, I realize it's nothing but an enormous amount of work for a big library, and you know some people hire archivists to do it, but what would be your recommendation for, for steps to do to, to accomplish something like this? So, you know, the first step in any of this is, what are you actually trying to do? And you know, is it, I want to preserve absolutely everything, or I have an important body of work or two here, or um, I'm trying to find uh, a place where my archive can go ultimately, or I'm trying to not leave a nightmare to my kids. Um, you know, what's the thing you're trying to do? And, and be honest about it. You know, I, I had a long talk with Franz Lanting a couple of years ago about this. And they have this, you know, wonderful archive of the of the natural world, and and he was very focused on trying to sell prints and do, you know, sort of his continue doing his work. It's like, no, you're you're at a different point in your life, and you really need to be thinking about where you're going to place this and how you're going to, you know, what kind of institution can take this collection and and what do they need, and how do you fund that? And so, first thing, what are you trying to do? Um, and then uh, more prosaic first steps, uh, get everything you wanna keep that's digital onto centralized modern storage. A shelf full of hard drives is a recipe for data loss and you know, sometimes worse, just the time that's lost when you, you know, hard drive malfunction, ah, I don't really know what's on there. Oh, crap and then now i've gone down a rabbit hole and i'm going to spend you know weeks trying to figure out what the hell's on there and how to recover it and so get it all consolidated onto central storage um uh another thing pilot projects that is an essential part of it like don't drink the ocean at once start um <laughs> a particular thing like i know this is important and and every time i consult with people you know in the institution level it's it's super important because they need buy-in from from the other people there so what what's um uh a part of this collection that is compelling and relatively easy to understand and organize and deploy and other people would like to see it um so so that you know, that's part of it. Uh, and I would say that, you know, the, the, well, I call it a book, but really it's a, it's a full video course with an additional book, uh, organizing your photos, um, is a, has a recipe uh, recipes in there for, uh, how you can, um, take an unorganized collection that hasn't been keyworded and just, to start grouping things, you know, b basically you want to put things into big buckets and then subdivide those buckets 
as time is available and as needs require. And, and the, you know, Lightroom's keywords do that beautifully. We, we do that beautifully at Tandem Vault too, <laughs> sort of swipe that. Um, but uh, that, the, what are we doing? C centralize everything and get it backed up, then pilot project, then look at what organization you you need and actually attach it to a body of work. It's really common um, in institutional settings when I talk to people about this. You know, they've never built a taxonomy before. And so they're sitting around a conference table with a, you know, Microsoft Excel spreadsheet trying to figure out how deep this keyword tree needs to be. And and they're not even working in something that lets you sort of fold it up and expand it out. And uh, and you know, Lightroom is is wonderful for this. The the keyword tree, the um, you know, the keyword list that you can organize into a hierarchy, allows you to play with with organizational structures and really easily revise those as you see. Oh well, this. These things actually don't go together, and and then you need you you need to unlearn some things about um, folder organization, and you know so the example is like should it be you know for a university should it be sports teams women's and then soccer tennis softball or should it be sports soccer men's women's and and when you're building <clears throat> building a taxonomy tree, it's probably better to have like sports, soccer, baseball, whatever. And then uh, if if you can get away with with this not being on PC, you know, then gender identity, <laughs> men's and women's, um, to to make instead of trying to make one taxonomy to rule them all, where everything fits neatly inside one big hierarchy, which the world doesn't work that way. You make multiple hierarchies dealing with the different characteristic. And hopefully that that's helpful that you can you can see that all in video form in the organizing your photos book. It, it does help. Let me ask a, a follow on then. Would you recommend Lightroom as opposed to Capture One for doing this work? And if undeniably. Okay, and and then the follow up to that is which version of Lightroom CC or a, um, or what? Do you process in Capture One? I do. Okay, um, so I could process in Lightroom. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, so anytime you're bifurcating your workflow between multiple applications, you're you're making it harder. And you are introducing significant possibility of loss of work, some way. Um, so, the the only thing I'll say then about the processing is, if it if it turned out you could get the results you're happy with in Lightroom, that would be a better place to do the work, because you can also do a much better job organizing it. And, and um, I met with the guys um, at phase one when I was over in Denmark, I guess it was about a year and a half ago. And, um, you know, they're working hard to make the application better, but they are a super long way away from having a really good catalog application. And um, even with the purchase of Media Pro, you know, they, they basically, anybody here from phase one? <laughs> uh, they, you know, they took some of the, they took some of the functionality, none of the, none of the internal guts of the thing were usable because it's all super old code. But um, uh, so yeah, organize it in Lightroom and uh, it's a, it's a great place to start this work and you can do, you can do a large collection. It, it really is, you know, among the most, the, the best metadata 
editors and and file organizers that has ever been made to a certain extent because of the photographers that like Seth and Peter and and to a certain extent myself that that really encouraged them and Thomas is a photographer um, and and you know they understood the importance of um, allowing the functionality to do what the photographers needed to, to do. But just for clarification, if I'm moving everything into Lightroom, would you recommend that I change everything over to DNG files? Uh, you're only getting engaged, you're not getting married yet. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I mean, ultimately, if you like it, the, the, that is driven primarily about your interest in processing. So um, if you're if you're staying in Lightroom and converting to DNG, you don't recommend embedding the raw. Uh, you can. It just it just makes it bigger. It's, yeah. Um, it it absolutely um, keeps the options open for uh, alternate processing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all the all the data is there in the DNG. The Capture One just doesn't choose to read it. Um, they ignore EXIF data so that they don't, when they find a DNG, so they're not applying their special sauce for that sure. camera and sensor, um, even though they could. Mm -hmm. so I wanna, it's a, you know, it's an engineering resource question. Yeah. It's a reasonable I question. Just one, one more point. I want to just, I've known Peter for a long time, um, just casually. I think we first met at a sports shooter event or a Palm Springs photo festival. Right, Palm Springs. I an, yeah. yeah, I got an edition, your very first edition of your book, which I, which you signed. <laughs> and I happened to have given it to a friend a couple of months ago. And he called me up and he said, you know, this book is signed. It's, is that important? I said, well, yeah, significantly. I said, why don't you give me a thousand dollars for it? And he <laughs> laughed. So I think that proves that you're, he didn't give it to me. So I think that proves that your book is priceless. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted Thanks. to get in this question from Larry uh, about sourcing drives. You know, we talked about not getting them from the box stores because they're probably the least um, checked. So where would you suggest purchasing your external drives from? Um, if you're purchasing an external, then, uh, you know, what I do is I buy GTEC drives in, in enclosures from B&H. Mm -hmm. And that so that's that's my preference there and i i believe i have been buying my uh I, it's been a little while since i bought a a bear drive but i think i'm more likely to buy a bear drive in a box from b h as well and again you know it's like don't don't get all twisted up around this the every hard drive is out to get you and so you know you have marginally better odds if it's not from Best Buy, but you know, mm -hmm. does, does Peter, it's marginally better odds. You're playing you're playing the odds a little bit. Yeah, Peter, I, I have a comment. I got into this very late. I'm sorry, um, but yeah. my process, which I follow a lot of the stuff you're doing, and you know, I talk to you a lot about uh, about it. I I try to do about eighty percent of where I need to go. My, my I have so many things in my archive. What I'm trying to do is just get it so I can use it for uploading on the internet and other things, get it quickly into Lightroom where I organize it. And then if I need it for something more and I really need to get into it, I now can easily find it and I can make a, a better scan of it, either a drum scan or take uh, more care in scanning it. Right now, my interest in the scanning is, is with the camera scan is just getting the stuff done uh, and going through as much as I can. So the, um, are, are you primarily in this question talking about camera scanning? No, I, I just wanted to make a comment since I got in late. I wanted to throw okay. in my two cents, but you know, I follow the stuff that you do and you really helped me on, on uh, initially just in realizing that I don't need everything in a thousand different um, folders that I can have one big folder for things and then let Lightroom divvy it up for me in collections. Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of general approach of doing what's needed at each step and not overdoing it is 
is a really important thing to keep in mind. And, and certainly like if you're organizing a collection that hasn't been organized before, then that shows up as let's get things in big buckets and I'll find, you know, then we'll see, oh, I'm doing a project and I'm, you know, need these to be more tightly annotated or, or edited. And we'll do that. Or uh, in camera scanning, you know, basically what I'm doing is just getting the stuff into Lightroom, get it, you know, get it scanned, know that I have a really good capture of that negative or transparency or print and, um, and that, that I've got a nice proof essentially of the, you know, if it's a negative of, of the positive image. And then if I'm going to do something with it that requires a better version than do that better version on demand. So how are you doing on time, Peter? I think I had Brett. a meeting at two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just throw uh, time for one, maybe follow up here from Steven on the M2 raid from before. Yeah. He's saying the SSDs max out at eight to 10 terabytes. So photographers that need main SSD storage of their whole archive, we were required to go to RAID SSDs. Hard drives are too slow for modern workflows. Hardware RAID, well recommended for HDs, is not recommended for SSDs. So that's where the soft RAID comes in. So I, I would question the workflow needs for massive throughput of multi-terabyte drives on anything like a regular basis. So again, I'd, I'd, I'd want to know more, but why, you know, as, as I was saying before, the, the lag time in processing is not an input output problem. It's a processor bound problem. So it's going to help you in a, a microscopic amount to be slightly fast, faster reading that, you know, uh, 50 or hundred megabyte file. Um, are you on a regular basis transferring terabytes of data from one device to another? I, that sounds like a pretty specialized workflow to me. I don't, I, you know, if somebody told me they were doing that, I'd be saying, I think maybe you're not doing that the easiest, safest way. Um, so, uh, you know, and video, video is definitely processor bound. These days, it's, you know, the, the video file is um, relatively quick to read compared to processing. So uh, I, I don't know where, where that shows up. I mean, and if you just want to throw money at it, um, I charge 200 bucks an hour and I'll tell you how to do it cheaper. <laughs> no, it's, it's, um, uh, I don't, again, I, I'm not seeing where NVMe for uh, um, tens of terabytes of data that should be unchanged makes sense as the, as the way that you'd store it. Does, does that, did I repeat myself enough times there? <laughs> Well, I think we can throw in one more question. Um, Alan's asking, is there a point where a Lightroom catalog becomes too big and should be broken down into multiple smaller catalogs? Um, uh, yes. And however, there is no way to know what that is for you because it's dependent on um, a bunch of things, including the hardware you're using and um how much metadata you have in your catalog. And so there's no, you know, I know people who are happily, they say, working with, you know, single catalogs with up to a million files. Um, I've never been able to get close to that before it starts to really slow down for me. Um, now I'm not using the latest hardware, but I suspect it's due to a large amount of metadata in the catalog. Um, so, the, so how much do you charge again, Peter? 200 bucks an hour. I'll call you. <laughs> so, 
So is your contact they, information somewhere for those of us who? Well, I just uh, plugged in the clutch to his books, and that'll bring yeah. you to the website. Yeah, and Peter at PeterKrog.com. Perfect. But um, uh, we're we're around the catalog size. Catalog size. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, you know it when it starts hurting you, <laughs> and um, I did write a whole book on multi-catalog workflow. You know, there are multiple reasons that one might want multiple catalogs. Like I have two people that need to work on the same thing, or I'm uh, off in the field doing a project and I need to then merge it back in, or my catalog just got so big, it just got too damn slow. And um, each of those reasons for using multiple catalogs prescribes a different workflow. And so it starts with you understanding why you need multiple. And it, it certainly can be just because this thing is too slow. And, and then, you know, the way I have it broken up is I have a works in progress catalog that has greatest hits and works in progress. It's got about 120,000 pictures in it. And then I have another one with 700 and something thousand that is the deep archive. Anytime I'm looking for something in the deep archive, it gets promoted up to the works in progress, greatest hits catalog. Cause if I've looked for it once, I probably want it again. You know, I'm ripping apart my studio and I have pictures from inside the walls that, and that's really helpful in a construction project. And it's like, I know they're in there. They're in, they're in that archive catalog. Okay. I found them. Now they're, now they're first class citizens. Cause I've needed them again. With Lightroom, okay. is there any way to get the previews file smaller? Um, the settings? Uh, you know, there's there's both the size and the level of compression. And so, you know, for me on my archive catalog, I have built it at the smallest size, um, which maybe is 1024, 768. Um, maybe it's 1280, 800. Uh, but then... Um, using low quality JPEGs for previews. That saves a ton of space. Mm. Um, quick... And then also uh, um, purging, having it automatically purge any full size previews after 30 days. And anytime you look at something in develop, it actually builds a full size preview. So if you're not discarding those, that, that makes your preview file get pretty big. I'm sorry, quick follow-up. Which version of Lightroom do you suggest? Um, generally, the most recent minus one. And when I, say, I think he means classic. Go for classic. Versus... Don't do CC. Do classic. Oh, oh, right. Oh, you yeah. mean, yeah, cloudy or files and folders. <laughs> um, files and folders. Cloudy with a chance of meatballs. That's no. <laughs> yeah, the, um, so a, a, um, it is the most atrocious branding in in the world of technology. Lightroom now means the thing that wasn't Lightroom. Right. But um, yeah, the the classic application is for for these large collections, and yeah, they it, I it was the right decision to split it off. Because they tried, they you know took a long run at trying to make one application do both, and it was just too hard. There were too many, <clears throat> too many options, and too many people had built too many different workflows mm. for them to make it work. And and uh, but it, I think it's a little past time where they should have made them work together better. I'm going to okay. ask you a question: Is there a place that? you would use cloudy um uh family share gotcha yeah i i just got a little windows laptop that i thought i'd do cloudy on but it it won't run it it's not it doesn't have enough memory or some yeah. other things you know it, it seems like it'll run lightroom classic but it won't run lightroom cloudy <laughs> yeah the um you know you you can integrate your phone uh, which is one of the things I absolutely love about about the way I have Lightroom set up is that 
um, I have it such that it bounces straight from my um, my phone. Everything I shoot bounces from my phone into uh, my main Lightroom catalog, and then uh, then I can also send back um, specific collections. You know the pictures uh, from Europe in 2017. Um, can send those back. So I have these collections. I can choose which things I want to have with me, which gives me like what I really want, which is all my, all my phone photos are going into my main catalog and the stuff I curate that I want to have with me at any given time I can have on my phone. That, and that for me was like revolutionary. Oh, well, Peter, I know you've got a meeting in about 10 minutes or so. So we'll give you a chance to get out of here. Uh, we didn't get into computational photography or copyright. Yeah. So if you want to come back again sometime and yeah, we can talk sure. about some of those things. I mean, this has been really informative and you know, everyone's head spinning. The, the chat's full yeah. of talk about Xanax. <laughs> um, so well, um, any, uh, it was a pleasure. Always thank good you. To thank you. Out. Yeah. Any Thanks, last Peter. minute? Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. I'm going to close. Facebook.